which was which was um, a very uh, new experience for me because I had uh, never been to Kenya before, never had seen a university hospital, not to speak about a rural hospital. So we had a very interesting time. I had my ups and downs, but um, if I understood correctly from you, Dr. Nyagi, uh, all our patient, uh, patients were fine. And so uh, it was the right thing what we did. When, Absolutely, Prof. <laughs> when, when being together with uh, uh, also Dr. Spire, um, he explained a few things about um, um, laparoscopic surgery and also endometriosis surgery in Kenya and also in Uganda. And so I'm happy to um, now visit for my first time also Uganda. Um, so um, my presentation will just be an overview and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, discussing this with you. As you can imagine, I have many, many videos, slides and comments on the topic of endometriosis, which <clears throat> I have been dealing with now for, I think, nearly 40 years or roughly 40 years. So there is a lot of also development that um, I can oversee. And uh, uh, seeing that uh, definitely in Kenya, uh, there is room for development. I can assure you that not long ago, we had the same situation in Germany and in other European countries, not to speak about the US and UK and, and, and so on. But um, uh, perhaps I should start and we use the time for, um, uh, for discussion and also for your comments. By the way, um, I hope you can see my background. This is um, a virtual background, but it is right behind my house. It's, it's an old castle, which is in ruins now. There is a nice restaurant over there, but other than that, these are ruins. And um, uh, so you might get a feeling from where I'm, I'm talking. We are one hour behind you, so it is still sunshine over here, whilst you might already experience the um, uh, beginning of the night. Anyway, so I will share my screen with you. And uh, <clears throat> I will go ahead with my presentation. And Dr. Spire had given me the topic endometriosis, the challenges of diagnosis and treatment, as is uh, the topic of tonight. And uh, I sort of uh, condensed it down to saying, what are the gold standards? And of course, we have to talk about gold standards in diagnosis. And the diagnosis begins with a proper anamnesis. Then there is an examination with speculum and rectovaginal exam and then there is imaging. First of all, the anamnesis is quite clear. Whenever there are ketaminial problems, problems related to menstrual menstruation, then one has to be reminded this could be endometriosis. And of course, there are the four Ds. I think it's good to put it the way like saying four Ds because Dysmenorrhea, dyspareunia, dyskesia, dysuria makes it easy also to say other gynecologist. My understanding is during such presentations, those that know all of this, they are here. But I would like to ask you to become multiplicators. You have to inform other gynecologists and other professionals about this disease and how to deal with it because they are the ones that they think they know everything already and they don't need to join such sessions. And <clears throat> uh, for them, this could be easy to remember the four Ds um, to, to immediately make a connection to this could be endometriosis. And of course, once either of these have become long lasting, then it could end up in chronic pelvic pain, CPP so that there is no 
connection with uh, menstruation anymore and uh, that is uh, uh, what what we have to what we have to um, uh, think about when when we are facing chronic pelvic pain the examination of course uh, should not be done with uh, a, a normal speculum please use a double speculum with a posterior and an anterior blade so uh, that you can properly uh, visualize mainly the posterior fornix sorry mainly the posterior fornix because that's where there are nodules of endometriosis and secondly i know this is not very nice but please do not hesitate please actively examine rectovaginally because only then you can feel uh, this part and the posterior aspect of the torus uterinum of the cervix because you have the, the longest finger, which is your middle finger, has to be in the rectum and then has to demonstrate um, th this, this side. Once you've done all this, of course, then an imaging should be done. And we've been discussing this also at Tumu Tumu. Best, of course, is if the surgeon can also perform the vaginal ultrasound, you should have a decent machine which you will have if you also do obstetrics, but you should also uh, have uh, a, a decent machine for a, um, um, a, a proper uh, gynecological ultrasound. And here you can see two kissing ovaries, and these ovaries have the typical aspect of chocolate cyst, of ovarian endometrioma, very homogeneous, uh, echogenic aspect of, of this. There is a little fluid in between, but here the ovaries are kissing. And here you can see an, an ovary with a chocolate cyst and there are other uh, cysts here. This is most likely to be a fairly large corpus luteum cyst with a coagulum being formed. And as mentioned down here, the Yota criteria have to be respected because in some cases, um, there might be the likelihood of overlooking a malignancy and therefore the IOTA criteria should be respected. On the right side of uh, this slide, you can see a normal looking uterus. Here is the endometrium and there is the bladder. The bladder is not ideally filled. Uh, usually when performing an ultrasound, particularly if there is dysuria, then the bladder should be half full or half empty, the way, whatever way you want to look at it. But in any case, you can see here, there is a huge lump. This huge lump is not belonging to the uterus. It is belonging to the uh, cystic wall. And you can see there, are, there is blood flow inside this, this lump. And <clears throat> this is a fairly massive bladder endometriosis. And um, uh, this bladder endometriosis is um, um, uh, to be taken seriously. And you can see um, also during imaging, during ultrasound, please download the hashtag answer and classification of endometriosis. It is freely available uh, on the internet. And that enables you also to um, classify these findings already before you perform surgery. The NCN classification started as a surgical or post-surgical classification. But meanwhile, with um, a very sophisticated ultrasound, we can already classify these patients before starting the surgery. And when talking about the pre-surgical workup, please do not forget that there is also the need for a kidney ultrasound. Why is it possible? Because a lot of patients with endometriosis, they have <clears throat> endometriosis of the uterus sacral ligaments. And when this endometriosis progresses, this will migrate towards the ureter. The ureter most often is not infiltrated, but we have a surrounding of the ureter by endometriosis and a strangulation and obstruction of the ureter. And this will lead to a silent kidney. And we have unfortunately seen 
quite a number of silent kidneys where we uh, combined our surgery with the urologist to remove uh, the kidney, which is very sad, even though there are two of these organs, but I think one should not risk uh, having uh, this. So whenever a patient where you think there is endometriosis or where you even see that there is deep infiltrating endometriosis, please perform a kidney ultrasound. For us, when we um, work according to our standards, to our guidelines, it has to be part of our treatment. Now, <clears throat> when we think of further diagnosis, and here you have one example of, this is the uterus, and here we have uh, the rectum, and this is a nodule inside the rectum, which is an endometriosis of uh, the rectum. This is the typical sign. It is, has a low echogenicity, whilst uh, the rectal wall has a high echogenicity. Uh, so if you see this, also with these, um, uh, even less echogenic areas, this is very likely to be um, an, an uh, endometriosis. And you can see here, the, the surgeon should be the one to do the ultrasound and then also do the laparoscopy. Here, of course, these are the normal powder burn implants of a, a septate uterus. And here we can uh, see again, um, this is a speculum in the posterior phonics. So this is endometriosis of the cal de sec, which penetrates to the um, uh, uterus sac ligament. Now, what is the gold standard of conservative treatment? Um, even though my, my main aim and field is surgery of endometriosis, of course, we have to talk about conservative treatment because not every woman needs a surgery and not every woman definitely wants a surgery. So we have to talk about GNH analogs, which means agonists and antagonists. We have to talk about progestins, about complementary uh, medicine and drugs and about uh, psychological counseling. Here you can see the, the dependence of the endometriotic implant. Sorry, I don't know why this moves. Um, so we have here the endometriotic implant and we can see uh, there are aromatase inhibitors which block uh, the conversion uh, into estradiol. Uh, we have um, um, uh, selective estrogen receptor modulators which block uh, at this end. We also do have selective progesterone receptor modulators which are on the same uh, area but all the, the, the working uh, selective progesterone receptor modulators, the most famous one is uh, UPA, ulipristal acetate. They are not suitable for long-term use, so therefore it is just uh, a niche product. GNIH analogs and progestins, of course, they block the proliferation, but they also block uh, the ovary and they might also uh, block um, the uh, hypothalamus uh, pituitary axis and uh, therefore also reduce systemic estrogen concentration. So these are the most common drugs. This is the mainstream of what can be done and that is luperelin acetate, relugulex and dianagis. These are the, the most uh, common drugs to be used uh, when using this arm and this is mainstream treatment. However, um, uh, a lot of patients cannot tolerate either of these. And the most common thing is with progestins, they get dysphoric or even uh, depressed, and therefore they have to stop this, this treatment, or they might develop headaches. And with GNIH analogs, um, a long-term treatment uh, longer than three to six months might induce uh, a bone mineral density. Uh, and that, particularly in young women, is um, uh, not a responsible form of treatment. Therefore, I'm quite happy that meanwhile we have some complementary aspects, and one is cumin, cumin not to be taken as a spice, but from uh, the pharmacy, it is an anti-inflammatory drug, and it also has a regulatory effect on the um, um, microbioma of uh, the bowel, 
and CBD. I know this is uh, a strange drug because uh, we also know this is something of the narcotic area, but it is quite an effective uh, painkiller. However, whatever we talk about, we need to take into consideration that there's no medical treatment that can definitely cure endometriosis. Now, infertility, and uh, you mentioned um, that there is a lot of concern about um, endometriosis and infertility. Now, uh, if we use hormones, they might prevent pregnancy, uh, even though um, GnRH analogs, uh, they help prepare for in vitro fertilization. So uh, in these patients, complementary medicine might even be the, the prime role. IVF has become a very, very important tool. It is known as an effective treatment for endometriosis-associated infertility. And one very important aspect is, please be quite reluctant to reduce uh, the endometrioma prior to IVF. It does not improve the IVF outcome. And depending on what surgeon is doing uh, the resection of uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, cyst uh, wall, it can damage the ovary. <clears throat> now, of course, um, uh, when um, resecting DIE, a deep infiltrating endometriosis, particularly of the bowel or of the uterus sacral ligaments, um, that seems to improve um, the outcome of uh, endometrio of um, infertility treatment. And of course, when there's pain associated with endometriosis, it needs to be uh, taken care of despite uh, positive uh, or whatever effects on IVF. Um, we, we need to take into consideration, sorry for, for jumping, um, that, um, uh, that um, endometriosis induces a chronic inflammation in the peritoneal cavity and therefore this has an impact by all the, the uh, chemokines and leukokines uh, that are being um, produced um, on the um, uh, fertilization process. Sorry, I'm not sure why all this jumping. Could. So we, we also have to do a psychological count, a counseling because we know that um, chronic pelvic pain uh, uh, quite often is associated with childhood sexual abuse and experience of violence. And unfortunately, I think we experience worldwide that there is uh, so much cruelty in the world. There are wars, that there, there is so much going on so that we have to take this into consideration because we we also see that there is movement uh, of, um, of migrants uh, also in, in East Africa. So, um, you know, if you have patients that you think might be associated with uh, violence, please think about it and also think about childhood sexual abuse. This is extremely difficult because it is a taboo topic. No, no one wants to talk about it. And uh, what we also need to know is chronic pain always has a psychological component which might be secondary because it will cause fatigue, sleeping disorders, headache, of course sexual dysfunction which in case of infertility is absolutely uh, counterproductive and it might also cause irritable bowel syndrome which then might induce a misdiagnosing of these patients because there are still by far too many also gynecologists that say you don't have anything, I can't see anything. And emotionally, these patients uh, experience fear, disappointment, depression. They have a negative self-concept and they tend to catastrophizing everything and uh, which might lead, uh, uh, go towards acquired helplessness. And this also means they need a psychotherapy, sometimes also accompanying uh, your treatment that, that you've done. When talking about the gold standard of surgery, of course, the most common form of endometriosis is peritoneal endometriosis. Next is ovarian endometriosis uh, as endometrioma or chocolate cyst, but then is bladder, bowel, rectal vaginal space, vagina, and a class of its own is adenomyosis. 
Here you can see a few samples of um, peritoneal endometriosis. I have shown these powder burn implants, which are the ones that some people think this is the only way of endometriosis. But you can also see the, at the, the right upper aspect, there is also endometriosis. And here you can see deposits of, uh, uh, of uh, former um, uh, bleedings. And here you can see a very fresh, active, uh, opalescent uh, implant of endometriosis, and this is also endometriosis. So whenever one sees this, this is very likely to be endometriosis. And uh, I personally think, maybe this is my surgical thinking, excision is better than coagulation. But I might also say this because I know because of Urethral obstruction following extensive coagulation of peritoneal implants. So it is always safer to excise, to expose the ureter. The ureter doesn't do us any harm, definitely not when we see it. So remove it and then, then it's fine. And also check for poorly visible implants. These are the ones. So if you are in doubt, if you only see little tiny spots, perform the thermal color test by SEM. It means that you have a bipolar forceps and you, you slightly open it and apply low current so that it is heated and you move across the peritoneal area. And then you suddenly will see if there's endometriosis uh, below that there is brown spots coming up. And of course, in some cases, if you see the entire pelvis, there, are, there is one implant next to the other please perform an extensive deperitonalization because this is what is recommended. Not take a few biopsies and then coagulate because what I have seen is not only that it leads to massive scar formation, but also there will still some survivors, like always. Also like in cancer, you will have surviving um, uh, aspects of um, endometriosis. Okay, when ovarian surgery, as mentioned before, ovarian surgery is uh, a very crucial subject. We, we have here a very common chocolate cyst and I'm showing this slide because you can really see the chocolate flowing out, the normal looking uterus and you can see here, this is active ovarian tissue. It was uh, in, in size and now the, the fruit uh, moves out and it is easy to remove uh, this part, but there's always one area of a chocolate cyst where it is stuck because where there is scar formation because the chocolate cyst is not a cyst, it is a pseudocyst. It has been formed by invagination of an implant on the outer aspect of um, the ovary and then it was invaginated and uh, the endometriosis implant was stuck on the surface of the ovary because due to ovulation, there are these little crevices and that's where it is easy for endometriotic uh, tissue to implant. So if we want to make a decision when to perform ovarian surgery, yes is age below 35 years, no previous surgery, good ovarian reserve, which can easily be monitored by an uh, anti-malarian hormone, if this is a patient with secondary in infertility, and if it is a unilateral endometrioma. Of course, you can see uh, the, the uh, other side is if the patient is over 35 years, if she had previous ovarian surgery, and if she has already a poor ovarian reserve, we do not want to expose her to an additional surgery because we know, and this has been very clearly proven that every surgery at the uh, chocolate cyst reduces the ovarian reserve. Therefore also, if it is a primary infertile patient, which is over 35 years, we have to be extremely careful. And of course, also if they're bilateral endometrioma, because we would have to do it at both ovaries, then it's getting too risky and we should perform uh, uh, something else, but not ovarian surgery. So what should we do when no ovarian surgery is recommended, like according to this list that, that we just saw? Um, of course, first of all, we should remove all other endometriosis implants. And we have to 
aspirate the endometrioma fluid so that we empty this. And um, we, we should keep the cyst wall intact. Perhaps what we can do is we open uh, the, the interior side of the cyst and we perform plasma coagulation of the cyst wall because we know that the depth penetration of the, the plasma beam is less than a millimeter. So therefore we keep the ovarian tissue intact. The other alternative would be alcohol installation. So we aspirate uh, the, uh, the, the endometriotic uh, fluid. We can flush um, the, um, the ovarian cyst. And once there's no more endometrial uh, fluid coming out and the cyst had been emptied, alcohol is being instilled and we leave it for five to 10 minutes. And then uh, we know that uh, this had been damaged uh, to the, the cyst wall, but not to the ovary. And <clears throat> of course, when we have um, an endometriosis patients, we need to make sure that the ovary is well placed in uh, the, the pouch of Douglas for good follicular aspiration in case IVF is the option of choice. Now, the next point is bladder endometriosis. And here you can see a nice case um, of uh, endometriosis. This is the uterus and you can see there is a superficial implant. These are the, the small aspects. There is a small implant, there is an implant. And um, if uh, we look again, we can see that this is a penetrating implant and you can see it looks a little strange. We uh, had this patient referred to us because the urologist saw this and the patient was complaining to the urologist, not to the gynecologist, that she had a problem with her bladder. She had a chronic cystitis. It was not a chronic cystitis, it was a bladder endometriosis. And uh, when he performed a cystoscopy, he found that there was a strange tumor. He removed um, a piece of this tumor and coagulated. And this white looks so, so blackish. And then he was uh, very surprised to find that this was endometriosis. If the anamnesis of this urologist would have been much better, then he would have found out that her, um, her uh, cystitis was always during her menstruation. So it was a catamenial cystitis, which is always very likely to be an endometriosis. Now, there is the vaginal aspect of um, DIE, and you can see here, there, is, there are nodules at the posterior fornix, and also here, and this is like the tip of the iceberg, what we see here. And therefore, what has to be done, we have to go ahead and we have to inject, we, we place a thread through there and we inject saline around this. And uh, you can then see what happens. We circumcise this tumor and this tumor is not small, as you can see. And you will also see when once the speculum is, there is the rectum coming up already. So uh, we excise this tumor from the vagina to mobilize it. And once this is mobilized, we also have the, uh, the incision line uh, close to the cervix, which um, guides us once we perform the dissection from above laparoscopically. Once we have done this, then we have the bowel um, in a flexible and movable position, and then we can decide what way uh, of treatment is uh, done next. Sorry. Here is one way, and this is just a schematic drawing here. You can see the sphincter. This is a circular stapler, and uh, I used uh, this industry graph by interponing. Uh, this, this is, as you can see, this is the bowel wall. This is the endometriosis, and the endometriosis has a thread through there, so uh, that the endometriosis can be pushed onto this middle line. And then, uh, and I will show you a slide. Uh, this is advanced towards the circular stapler. And as you know, there is a stapling line. 
and there is also a circular cutting. So what we do is uh, we remove this. I think you, you have seen this. Um, so first of all, this is removed with a thunder beat. This is the tumor on top, um, which some people call shaving, but there is still enough tissue there which is still infiltrated by endometriosis. As you can see here, this is all endometriosis. And now we, we perform a, a, an incision through there. It is an, a Z incision and uh, there is the knot and this tissue is pulled towards the midline of the circular stapler. Now we advance the circular stapler and all this has been excised and we can, we can do this without opening the bow. This is, this is the most effective way of uh, removing endometriosis, uh, a, a nice classical way um, from the anterior wall. So what to be done in order to get more systematic? If we have lesions that just reach towards uh, the bow, then we perform shaving. If there is infiltration of the, uh, uh, the bowel wall, we do never know how far the infiltration might go. So we perform a disc excision the way perhaps uh, we've shown. And of course, all other areas, we perform segmental excision and the segment might be even longer. We have done up to 20 centimeters of excision if there are several uh, implants of endometriosis. And mind you, whenever there is one implant, please check if there's not another one. Here we can see that there is endometriosis of the small bowel, which is again a, a trickier way. Here we can see the excisional uh, point. It has been the ilium. And uh, for that, we uh, were asking a visceral surgeon to come. And now <clears throat> the next aspect is adenomyosis. Here you can see an MRI of an adenomyosis. Meanwhile, we do not need MRI anymore because we can clearly visualize this using vaginal ultrasound. Here you can see this is vaginal ultrasound. The anterior wall is much thicker than the posterior wall. And uh, you can see this, this ray sign like a sun rays. If you can see this, this is clearly a symptom of, <clears throat> of adenomyosis. And uh, what we have seen is that um, a lot of patients with such a finding um, get the uh, advice by the gynecologist, okay, we have to remove your uterus. And this, I think with women that, that want to have children and that are desperate to have children is unfair. So my, my plea is, allow these patients to have a chance to maintain their uterus and have children. And I will show you how to do this. Um, of course, there are different treatment options. Um, one is um, that uh, we, we can apply GnRH agonists, uh, which will reduce this. But as I said, no medical treatment can cure this. And we know the longer the, the, the GnRH agonist down regulation has been, uh, the more uh, successful is an IVF treatment. Of course, there are also um, um, surgical treatments from. We can excise the adenomyotic tissue, and we know that the clinical pregnancy rate is higher, even uh, talking about spontaneous pregnancy, um, when, when it comes to uh, post-surgical events. And this is the way to do it. Um, it has been um, described by Osada. You can see here a classical um, picture of an adenomyosis. And this is how he has done it. It is a longitudinal incision of the uterus. You put one finger into uh, the um, uh, the uh, um, uh, uterine cavity, and then you excise this um, with uh, either with an ultrasound or I use a bipolar. And then uh, he has a three flap uh, technique. Um, 
we modified this according to my previous uh, teacher and you can see we have more than three flaps uh, this is one flap this is one flap this is one flap and this is another flap and it is <clears throat> that we take care to reduce uh, the volume inside because you have uh, like a flower of the uterus because the um, the cavity is open the cavity will be uh, closed but then uh, i might even incise this in order to have small flaps that are covered on top and that there is no uh, no cavity inside and finally what i do is i use suture through here which compresses everything so that there is no hematoma formation even possible uh, to do but i must say this is um, this is one um, slide there is a tourniquet applied so there is no bleeding and um, this is from flushing and um, um, it is a mini laparotomy so this is not a um, laparoscopic approach what i would very much like to highlight is the gold standard of classification meanwhile is the ensign classification because it covers the peritoneum, the ovary, the tube, and definitely the deep intrathecal endometriosis, which the American Fertility Society uh, classification does not cover. And you can see here, please download from uh, this um, link the hashtag NCN classification, or you just type in hashtag NCN and you will get uh, this classification. Now, last but not least, my conclusion. The gold standard for endometriosis treatment is infertility, benefit of radical removal, unless compromise is indicated. And that is definitely uh, applicable to ovarian surgery. Uh, think of IVF. IVF is um, a very, very good option for infertile patients. Medical treatment uh, can be used when effective and when there are no side effects to be taken into consideration, particularly with progestins. Think about headaches, migraine, and um, depression. I can only advocate to uh, also include into your armamentarium complementary medicine. Uh, this might also be regarded as holistic medicine, but is, it is less harmful than a lot of the medical treatments and in many cases it is it is just as good or even better than uh, the the classical uh, medical treatment form surgical surgery should be performed as radical as possible and uh, it is not the more surgeries the better the first surgery should be the last surgery at least this should be our aim we know that there is a recurrence but if the first surgery is not really trying to completely remove all the endometriosis, then we know that she will have to come again. There is um, a no proven prophylaxis, and uh, we, at least in my country, perform uh, a rehabilitation after every uh, DIE surgery. And uh, what we have to know is, and this is why it takes quite some time for consultation of these patients, there is no one fits all treatment. So this is this is the final plea. Now uh, with um, uh, Dr. Yamal Patel, we have discussed um, what is uh, the, the problem with um, endometriosis centers. And uh, I just give you an idea of the structural requirements. Um, we have um, we have some some structural requirements. Sorry for this jumping. Um, uh, the, uh, the treatment should be according to guidelines. Um, surgical treatment has to be well done. Um, there has to be an interdisciplinary uh, group which discusses cases. There should be an abdominal surgeon and uh, maybe also radiologist. Um, there have to be cooperation with an endometriosis center, with a fertility clinic, with an IVF center with a practice of psychosomatic pain therapy, physiotherapy, and um, uh, with the um, uh, endo warriors. Personal requirements, um, the head has to be a specialist in gynecology, has to be a designated endometriosis uh, surgeon, 
a surgeon with um, an endometriosis um, diploma, certificate of qualification course, and uh, perhaps also a master class of endometriosis and uh, a certificate of continuing education for designated surgeons. And last but not least, um, um, at least 100 patients should be treated in this center um, and uh, 50, sorry, 50 patients that uh, underwent uh, surgery and uh, um, it has to be a designated endometriosis surgeon with at least 30 operated or responsible assisted cases. The documentation has to be uh, done and it, it is advisable to have a, um, a proper uh, documentation where the patient help you if you use a questionnaire. Now, by saying this, I end my talk. Sorry for this scribbling. I don't know how it got onto my slides, but maybe it was uh, me touching uh, a button. So thank you very much. And I'm open for any question and discussions. Wow. Um, thank you very much, Professor Tinebag, for that elaborate and wonderful discussion. Uh, you've pretty much covered um, most of the uh, issues I had on my list, but uh, nonetheless, I would uh, inform you that I have some questions in the, in the chat box. Uh, to the audience, I request you either put your questions in the chat box or you, um, you can raise your hand or you're free to unmute and ask your question. Uh, Prof, allow me to ask these questions in the chat box. May I please? You want me to? This Professor is Professor Tinabag. Yeah. You want me can to? I, can I read you these questions? Yes, so, I have like uh, six questions in the chat box. Maybe okay. we can have one at a time. Uh, uh, some of them will go to the panelists as well. Is, okay. Is that okay with you? So one is when doing a digital rectal vagina exam, should the rectum be empty, and what's the best time for exam during the cycle? First of all. Of course, if the rectum is empty, it is much nicer for the patient and also for the examiner, because if you remove uh, your finger and the glove, uh, you know, if the rectum is not empty, then uh, it, is, um, it is very smelly, but you can feel um, in any way. However, if uh, this is a patient with an obstipation, then of course you might feel a tumor, which is only um, the, the feces that is in there. Concerning the day of cycle, I do not, uh, I do not recommend any particular uh, day, day and cycle. Of course, if uh, you examine immediately before the, the, the cycle starts, because most endometriosis patients will complain about pain a few days before their bleeding starts. So that might even be better if you do the digital exam um, in order to find trigger points. The next question is, is there any role of combined oral contraception in conservative management of endometriosis? Yes, there is. Um, uh, if when we have combined uh, oral contraception, the benefit of this is that there is no bleeding. So we stop bleeding and uh, we think that uh, in 95% uh, of uh, endometriosis patients, retrograde menstruation will be the reason for their endometriosis. And therefore, these women benefit if their menstruation is stopped. However, if um, they can tolerate, um, of course, it would even be better to have just a gestogen or progestin only pill. The next is after extensive peritonal, peritonectomy for pelvic endo and nodule excision, what is usually the outcome one year down the line in terms of quality of life? Um, I must say the quality of life of these patients, depending on the, the way that you have performed your surgery, you have to be very clean and meticulous, but if you do it, 
uh, that way. Then already, let's say, four weeks after surgery, the patient will report to you that she is very happy and very relieved from, from this pain. However, you have to be radical in re removing all implants. Otherwise, this will continue. Next question is, is there a relationship between endo and gastritis? No, there is not. But I have also seen gastric endometriosis. So endometriosis can be everywhere. And um, with a gastritis, which is the inflammation of the, the gastric mucosa, perhaps there is some, some other aspect um, uh, which needs to be taken into consideration. But on the other hand, it can also be that there is endometriosis. Um, the next is very informative webinar. Thanks, Dr. Speyer. Congratulations. And the Association of Laparoscopic Surgery of Ghana. For okay. That was Dr. Mecha. Thank you very much. So, th um, would you recommend single agent therapy or combination therapy for those who are counseled for medical management? Well, of course, I would prefer single uh, drug uh, management because then you know much better what, uh, what is active and what is not. So this, of course, is um, quite helpful. If you think that you have to combine, for instance, if you want to, to test a painkiller, you, you have a hormone plus a painkiller because sometimes this is important, but then uh, the, 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 you have to modify the, the painkiller, but you keep uh, the hormone like the progestin in the cell. So, IV Edong, before I was di diagnosed with endometriosis, I was found to have ascites. Does endometriosis cause ascites? Endometriosis can cause ascites, but minimal. So, uh, since endometriosis is associated with an inflammatory state in uh, the abdominal cavity. It can, of course, uh, create ascites, but in general, the ascites is not as abundant as, for instance, in ovarian cancer or, or in other malignancies. What is your preferred aromatase inhibitor, dose and duration of treatment? Can they be used in combination with GnRH analogs or antagonists? First of all, I would never combine the aromatase inhibitor with uh, a GnRH uh, agonist or antagonist. And as a matter of fact, um, uh, my, um, my application of aromatase inhibitors is, uh, is fairly limited. I, I have to mention this, but it is not my preferred uh, form of treatment. Uh, not when it comes to combined treatment with um, infertility patients, nor when it comes to uh, um, uh, treatment of just endometriosis patients. So I would always uh, prefer to have uh, to, to start the treatment with um, a, a GNH uh, uh, agonist or even with an antagonist. The antagonist, um, meanwhile, there is uh, um, an antagonist, Rilugulux, which is an oral antagonist. This is the one that can be reduced uh, in the amount because you, you can sort of titrate the effect. And uh, this means that you can uh, take as much of the antagonist that there is still a baseline secretion of estradiol, but baseline means maximum of 40 picograms per mil. And that is uh, what, what uh, should be used. First question is, Osana technique, why was it performed in open surgery? Well, answer your first question. For me, um, I have a better feeling of closing uh, the uterus um, in a proper way than if I would do it by laparoscopy. And uh, also um, I have a better feeling for all of this because this is quite complicated in a three dimensional way and I have, can have better assistance. So I know that a good friend of mine, Jörg Kickstein, he excises sometimes 
small uh, adenomyotic nodules from the uterus. But with this large endometrioma, I always recommend patients a mini laparotomy. So mini laparotomy means um, maximum of 10 centimeters and um, the uterus is being pulled up so that it is uh, in front of the abdominal wall. And then you can uh, place uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, um, closure of uh, the, the blood vessels um, and the, uh, you have a bloodless uh, treatment and uh, you, you can take it in your fingers and you can have assistance helping you. And the, the second question is, the cumin seeds can be taken or has it to be in a drug from the pharmacy? If you, of course, you can take cumin seeds. The cumin seeds is known like golden milk, but uh, the concentration is too low to have a significant anti-inflammatory effect. So from that point of view, it would be better to take uh, the, the cumin as a, um, a concentrated drug. Uh, Dr. Davis, I know routine ovarian reserve assessment should be a must before surgery. Wonderful. That's very good. That's along my line. If someone has low reserve and with fertility desire, please advise on the best way to handle and manage these patients, especially when surgery and IVF is needed. Well, I, I gave two examples, and that is, well, well one way is to just... Um, aspirate the fluid and leave everything uh, as such, only removing all the other um, endometriosis implants. Alternatively, if it is a huge cyst, one can instill alcohol or one can do the, um, uh, the argon beam uh, fulguration or coagulation, which is uh, better than, than this. But the older the patient is and the lower the ovarian reserve, then I would be very hesitant of doing anything at the ovary um, um, with the exception of um, aspirating the, um, uh, the, the fluid. Um, uh, Sheila Nabuma writes, I had, three sur I had surgery three weeks back and I'm glad Dr. Yama, congratulations, was my surgeon as he was quite thorough. We'll be getting on endosuppression soon. Endometriosis seems to be a systemic disease. Question, would you please say something about endometriosis outside the pelvic cavity, diaphragm, thoracic cavity, brain? Oh, this, uh, this is a complete um, new uh, um, lecture because, of course, uh, endometriosis can be everywhere from the brain to the legs. It can be everywhere. And therefore, if there is pain, which is cyclic, or as we call it, catamenial, then we have to rule out that it is endometriosis. It can be in the eye, it can be in the ears, it can be in the ear lobe, it can be everywhere. So there is no limitation to endometriosis. Thank you for this question. And also, thank you for uh, praising Dr. Yamal Patel. Um, comment about the utility of transvaginal ultrasound versus MRI in diagnosis of endometriosis. As a matter of fact, if there is a, a decent ultrasound machine, um, the, the benefit of, um, of vaginal ultrasound is that you can perform it yourself. You have a dynamic uh, image. You can apply the Doppler on, on the MRI and you have an extremely good visualization. And meanwhile, we train our assistants to demonstrate the ureter, to demonstrate the bowel in every patient that is being uh, investigated or examined. And this is the training one needs in order to find out uh, where this goes. And I understand that um, Dr. Nyagi uh, is ambitious to learn all these techniques, which he will be doing by the end of this year. So this is the way to go. One has to set a rule to always try to demonstrate the ureters, to demonstrate uh, the rectum. Now, it sounds like as if I do not like MRI. MRI is excellent, particularly 
when you suspect that there might be endometriosis that is beyond the depth of 10 centimeters. And also, I have a, a referral of a lot of patients with nerve endometriosis. So these nerves um, are very hard to, to be demonstrated by vaginal ultrasound, particularly if, if it is the sciatic nerve or if these are these uh, sacral nerve roots. And therefore, um, I need a good MRI. But I must admit, there are only a few um, radiologists in Germany that I would trust uh, if I send a patient to them. Um, because the routine radiologist, which is the, the private radiologist around the corner, will not bother about uh, this, this disease. And I found that this is a global problem. So the radiologist has to be interested in endometriosis and then he or she will detect um, uh, also this, this form, uh, form of endometriosis. And by the way, the vaginal probe, if it is not too big, can also be used um, in, uh, as a rectal probe. And um, um, two days ago, I was performing um, a hysteroscopic resection of an adenomyotic uh, cyst in the uterus. And this was monitored by uh, the vaginal ultrasound in the rectum, showing me the right area where to do my resection. Um, thanks for the presentation. The ancient classification doesn't seem to classify endometriosis, but rather descriptive classification. No, it, it does classify uh, the endometriosis because you get a, a code, a code of uh, P for peritoneum, O for ovary. It is, it, it, the enzyme classification or the hashtag enzyme is based on the TNM classification for cancer. So it is, it is quite comparable rather to a cancer classification than to any other classification. Mm -hmm. What would you recommend for a patient who has had 10 surgeries and comes back with recurrence? Well, um, 10 surgeries is too much. And <clears throat> of course, this woman has to undergo radical surgery. And then uh, depending on her age and whether she wants to be pregnant, but then I would also put her on Dianagist or on, on any other form of suppressive uh, treatment. So Dr. Speyer, this is what I saw as questions. Dr. Speyer, you're muted. Oh, sorry, yeah. Thanks, Prof, for answering those questions. Quite, quite elaborate. I want to ask the audience, if you have any questions, any more questions, please, you can unmute or place them in the chat. And uh, meanwhile, to my panelists, I have a few more questions for you out of the chat. I think uh, this will go to Dr. Yamal. Uh, Dr. Yamal, um, I've had uh, um, um, some very good comments about you and your surgery. Um, why would some women have persistence of pain after surgery? Uh, you can answer that and also give us a few of, of your comments from the previous uh, discussion, please. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Chikundu. And uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, Tinaberg. That was an excellent summary of every gold standard practice that should be used for managing uh, endometriosis in a nutshell. Uh, obviously, as we were discussing, I had also been jotting down a few things that we wanted to discuss among the panelists and with Prof and with you. So time permitting, we'll go into that. But to answer your question at the moment, uh, why would we be dealing with, I mean, persistence of pain? So there are, there are two, three things. Uh, number one, it could be because of an incomplete surgery. So an incomplete surgery, especially as you've heard Prof saying about trigger points, and many of them are specifically in areas near the, the uterocircal uh, ligaments. It could be near in the posterior compartment. 
uh, it could be near the anterior part where there is the bladder involvement. So if you do not uh, excise all the tissue and the lesions in total, uh, then you will definitely be left with the persistence of pain. Second thing is you heard Prof very well say that uh, many of his advanced surgeries, most of them undergo what is called a rehab. And a rehab is sometimes necessary because some of this pain is obviously uh, including functional. And if there's a little bit of a functional involvement, then you need to train the patient to under understand that this is going to be something that will improve, but may never disappear completely. Finally, uh, you heard him specifically mention nerve involvement. Now, uh, one of the most difficult endometriosis is in the neuropelviology area. So if there is a nerve involvement with uh, compression due to the nerves, I mean, by some endometriotic lesion, uh, it is going to be a very difficult task uh, to remove that next to the nerve without possibly injuring the nerve. So these are some of the reasons why persistence of pain may be seen in patients uh, who have had surgery. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yamal, for those comments. And, yes, uh, and, and sorry, one more thing that could be added is many of the chronic pelvic pain uh, syndromes are not sometimes always related to endometriosis. Interstitial cystitis or irritable bowel syndrome are many times uh, linked with it. So we have to look into that as well when you ask someone with persistence after surgery. Okay, um, Dr. Yamal, if I can uh, remain with you uh, uh, for a little while. Um, there's a question about adolescents and endometriosis. Um, there are uh, quite a number of times a gynecologist comes in face with an adolescent with severe pelvic pain or dysmenorrhea. Um, when and when not to intervene? How do we go about this? Uh, Thank you very much for the question. When not to intervene and when to intervene, I think is, uh, is, is not a statement that should be clear. Intervention is required at all, at all stages. Let's not uh, assume any pelvic pain of a severe nature in, a, in, a, in an adolescent as normal. So that normalizing of pain is, is a problem. It's a crime because that makes them go into severe disease later. Now, whether it is due to endometriosis or not, whether she needs something surgical or not is a totally different story. I'm not saying intervention means surgery. But I'm saying that intervention necessarily needed. Uh, sometimes uh, it could be primary dysmenorrhea and many, many young adults and girls respond superb to uh, combined contraceptive pills, for example. And if it disappears and there are no obvious abnormalities in an ultrasound that was done, then definitely it is something that can be continued. However, if you get somebody with severe dysmenorrhea and you also get some lesions noted in the pelvis, then start thinking of possibilities of some Mullerian anomalies that could be blocking and then causing, uh, let's say, secondary endometriosis. Think of a non-communicating horn with an endometrioma or a, or a collection inside. Think of, so these are the kind of things you start thinking of in very young girls who present with severe disease and who actually are seen with some pathology when seen on an MRI or an ultrasound done. So intervention, definite, uh, but what kind, whether it's medical, whether it's counseling, whether it is eventually going to be surgical, should be important. Secondly, such people may need early referrals to centers that handle endometriosis and pain early so that they don't go into very severe disease before a diagnosis is made. So that's very important. Thank you very much for that. Prof, um, do you want to add anything on that, please? We, yes, I'm, I'm very glad that Dr. Yamal mentioned all of this. Uh, it means also that uh, we as doctors sometimes have to act like detectives. <clears throat> if um, if um, a woman or if a young woman or a girl is reporting about cyclical pain, uh, we should not, if we do not see something at first uh, presentation, we should not say, I don't see anything, so you don't have anything. We, we need to um, investigate this any further. And <clears throat> um, I, I was quite happy to also to hear Dr. Yama mention about 
uh, a unilateral um, obliterated horn. Uh, I have seen all of this uh, also during our surgery at Tumutumu, and I've also seen a septate vagina with a uterus duplex where, where the one part of the vagina was blocked and she always had uh, problems and pain and swelling in there. <clears throat> and I've also seen that also following delivery, uh, patients uh, were complaining about cyclical pain in the episiotomy uh, scar. And the doctor said, no, 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 everything is fine. It's not fine. There was endometriosis in the episiotomy scar, as well as we know, um, endometriosis in the cesarean section scar. And as we know, following a cesarean section, there is also endometriosis of the brain or of the lung or, or wherever. So whenever there's something catamenial, whenever there's something linked to menstruation, then we, we have to follow this up. And as, as Dr. Yamal said, doesn't necessarily mean that surgery is being performed. But first of all, we are the advocates of women with this uh, disease and with this complaint. And we have to make sure that they get the proper diagnosis because that then finally triggers uh, the treatment. Thank you very much. Um, uh, some more questions popping up in the chat box. Um, can I put them across? Uh, someone uh, asks, does pregnancy heal endometriosis? In some women, then so, of the yeah. panelists can can answer this. Yeah, uh, thank, you. thank you, thank you, Dr. Spire. I think I'll take that question. Uh, does pregnancy heal endometriosis? No but uh, pregnancy suppresses the symptoms of endometriosis. So let's understand, even when we talk about medical treatment, we are talking of two mainstays of treatment medically, uh, if we're talking hormonal, and that's number one, pseudo-pregnancy regimes and pseudomenopause regimes, which means anything that mimics pregnancy suppresses the pain and slows the growth. Anything that mimics I mean, menopause eventually, so that is GNRH analogs and the like, would suppress the endometriosis. Pregnancy in itself would mean that she doesn't have periods for nine months. It would suppress endometriosis for the nine months and probably for a few more months if she's having lactational amenorrhea. But the moment the periods come back, the symptoms and the disease would restart growing again. So I think it will suppress, not heal the disease. I agree with you. I agree with you. Um, maybe you can also uh, talk about this. I have a patient with umbilical endometriosis. She can't manage surgery uh, with the best. Which best medication should I give in the rural setting? Uh, do you want well, to answer that as well? Well, <laughs> Anyone? well may I ask, why can't she manage her surgery? I mean, this is, this is not a very complicated surgery. It is um, uh, a skin surgery. One has to excise it and when ha one has to reform an umbilicus because she would look uh, strange without an umbilicus, but it has to be removed. And this is not a very exotic uh, presentation of endometriosis. So it should be removed. Any form of medical treatment, which is systemic, is more harm to her than just this, this surgery. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, I, I agree. Um, Dr. Anjagi, um, I know you're very passionate about uh, laparoscopy and you started up laparoscopy machinani, which is basically taking laparoscopy to the rural. Um, and uh, in my opinion, uh, Minimaxis doesn't uh, get its benefit until the, um, the right owner, um, and that is the, the person on the ground. Um, I want to ask you, what uh, um, advice would you give to the gynecologist? Because I've seen um, endometriosis has a wide scope of uh, problems from bladder to bowel, and uh, it takes a lot of uh, skill to be able to operate and, and, and to take care of the disease. The gynecologists kind of think the uh, disease is not theirs, 
but I, I have a feel that endometriosis is an entirely a gynecologist affair, though it has a lot of um, discipline. How do you um, encourage a guy to, to get good in this area? Uh, well, thank you so much, Dr. Spire. Um, we, uh, I think we have to acknowledge that uh, endometriosis is not only in rural setup, that it's a challenge. Uh, Professor Tineberg has mentioned it. Uh, so first things first, I had Professor Tineberg during his last trip here when he gave the story of uh, Professor Kat Sem uh, with his first um, appendectomy. And he was put to task because uh, he was operating on a field that was not his for the general surgery. Uh, what really set him uh, lose was that this appendix actually had endometriosis and endometriosis is a disease for gynecologists. So it has to be a clear. Uh, Professor Tineberg has uh, just demonstrated um, uh, endometriosis of the bladder with um, uh, urologist uh, taking a biopsy, coagulating and uh, taking a biopsy. And of course, then the patient is sent to the gynecologist. So uh, we have to take the uh, fact that uh, endometriosis is a condition for gynecologists. But having said that, we have to embrace that uh, this role of multidisciplinary, but the lead should be a gynecologist uh, um, under all circumstances. Now, in different setup, uh, for example, when Professor Tineberg came and um, it's uh, what most uh, endometriosis specialists are, as a gynecologist or uh, as a pelvic surgeon, you're able to handle endometriosis in the rectum. You can perform resection and anastomosis. You can do shaving on the ureter. Sometimes you can do um, resection and anastomosis of the ureter and so on and so forth. Uh, but... Having said that, this is not, um, uh, you know, that short um, uh, skill to attain. It's a process. And uh, endometriosis uh, needs to take a high index of suspicion. So it does not start with laparoscopy. It has to start from clinical and uh, detailed examination of the patient and, you know, consistent um, examination. One of the biggest challenge, not only surgery, is actually making diagnosis. Uh, there's very um, uh, little skill in picking up these nodules. Uh, now, that's having said that, uh, we've also uh, said that uh, the gold standard should be laparoscopy. But then again, laparoscopy is still not very accessible, not, you know, and the skill is not that available. So where do we start? I think uh, that was the question. I think we have to start with picking up the skill. How are we going to do that? It's going to be process like, you know, training and mentorship and programs. You know, um, uh, Dr. Yamal has started a training program at Thad Park. So once we, we have to start with the basics and with this basics, then we have to be able to pick these nodules or uh, we need to pick up endometriosis. Now, picking up endometriosis, it doesn't mean uh, the gynecologist with a skill of laparoscopy actually has a skill for managing endometriosis. And this is where we have to break the cycle. Uh, Dr. Wenda just asked a question and this is happening, you know, uh, you know, our hospitals, whereby a patient is undergoing 10 surgeries. Honestly, that should not be acceptable. So we need to embrace the process of um, uh, referral process that we know this can be managed and this cannot be managed. Uh, finally, uh, I want to still again reiterate what Professor Tineberg has mentioned, that the role of management, if it's surgical, uh, it should be excision of the endometriosis. This uh, has a better outcome and this, um, the rate of recurrence again is reduced. So, uh, you know, Dr. Spire, the, the need is just enormous. And uh, what laparoscopy machinery is to answer the question is try to see if we can bridge these gaps and we can make uh, these services are uh, accessible and available in rural setup, which I think uh, is the majority of um, the community that we are all serving. I hope that answers your question. 
Here, yeah, it cannot get overemphasized and that gynecologists have to gain the speed of minimal access surgery. Um, it all starts from the diagnosis. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question here about uh, infertility. Um, we know endometriosis um, causes a lot of challenges with fertility, and uh, this goes to you, Dr. Mark Meingo. Um, when do you decide to operate and when uh, uh, would you uh, want to have a pregnancy, uh, then surgery later? Then the other thing is, uh, uh, I think Prof answered part of this, does surgery improve the quality of oocytes? I think Prof uh, talked about that, but I also want to ask you, is there a role of fertility preservation um, um, before, before surgery? Yes. Dr. Mark. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Spire. I hope I'm uh, audible enough. Uh, yes, you Professor, are. Professor, thank you very much for that, uh, very, uh, that very good uh, presentation. Yeah, we know that, of course, uh, the issue about endometriosis and infertility has been uh, debated over a number of years. And uh, there was a slide that Professor showed that was very, very important about when you decide to do surgery and when not to do surgery. Of course, uh, when you have a low ovarian reserve, a person is above 35 years and, um, you know, uh, someone has had uh, probably previous surgery, you, you might be a little bit hesitant uh, with uh, starting with surgery. One of the things that we usually do is that uh, sometimes you can uh, segment your cycle. Most of the patients, especially who have um, moderate to severe disease, might... Uh, uh, might benefit a lot uh, from uh, surgery eventually. But at the beginning, uh, probably it's better uh, that you do um, your oocyte uh, retrieval, uh, probably fertilize and freeze. Then the person can go for surgery. And then after that, you can then decide to do a frozen embryo transfer. After you've done some bit of down regulation with a GNRH analogs, uh, that would improve the outcomes. As we know very well is that uh, fecundity decreases markedly uh, with infertility. Uh, uh, you know, in the normal population, the fecundity might be about 0 0.15 uh, to 0 0.2 per, per month. But in, uh, in endometriosis, it's uh, about 0 0.1, between 0 0.02 and 0 0.1. So that means that when you add surgery, like Professor said, you will markedly reduce uh, on the ovarian reserve uh, and then, of course, that will have an impact. If you decide to do surgery first, uh, probably you might be doing that to help with uh, access to the, the ovary uh, when you're doing uh, follicular, uh, when you're doing follicular pickup, when you're doing oocyte pickup. But otherwise, uh, Professor rightly said uh, very easily, uh, very well, that um, there's sometimes when you can't do surgery. It's very, very important that. Uh, Fertility, uh, especially the AMH is done before you opt for surgery. And then, of course, uh, when the surgery has been done, we probably need to have a look at it again. The second thing that you asked was about um, fertility preservation. Yes, fertility preservation plays a very important role. If, uh, for example, the patient decides that they need to do surgery uh, for any of the other things that they might not be interested at all in having children in the moment, but probably will give it a thought later. Yes, then fertility preservation plays an important role. It can be done in a number of ways. You can decide to, um, uh, to uh, do uh, oocyte, uh, you, you, you oocyte uh, retrieval and uh, keep them. You can decide to take part of the ovary and, um, and, uh, and store it or preserve it, cryopreserve it until the time when they want to use uh, those follicles or rather the, 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 the oocytes. But uh, fertility preservation definitely has a role. If uh, the person's um, uh, problem majorly is chronic pelvic pain, and they're not yet ready to have children, they're not probably even thinking about it. Maybe you'll give it a thought later, then they will definitely um, have a very good um, Okay, Dr. Mark, are you done with that, that submission? Yes, I think I'm done for now. Oh, okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mark, for that. Uh, Prof, do you want to add on uh, the issue of fertility 
um, an endometriosis, especially the issue, the issue of preservation. Is there anything you want to comment about it, please? Well, with pleasure. I can fully support all that my that the previous speaker, Dr. Mark, had mentioned. Uh, and I might give an example <clears throat> that I just recently had in our surgery. And that is, it was a woman aged, uh, I think, 39. And uh, she was diagnosed with quite extensive adenomyosis. And uh, um, since we had very good experience with... Um, fertility improvement by, after removal of adenomyosis, uh, the uh, modified OSADA technique that I demonstrated, um, I asked the fertility center to uh, um, uh, perform uh, oocyte pickup and uh, preserve the oocytes before we perform the adenomyosis surgery because that would need some healing yeah? uh, in general. Um, my, my advice is if the, the surgery has been, this extensive surgery of the uterus has been performed, it is not necessary to wait for more. Some people say you have to wait for two years. Um, the minimum time I want these women not to become pregnant is three months. Because in this time, the scar formation will, will be done, everything will be clear and everything will be fine. And then uh, she doesn't start with the pregnancy of, let's say, uh, men's uh, uh, five or six, but she will start with men's one and two. And uh, this is a slowly developing process with a lot of growth factors being produced. So this is fine. But nevertheless, it is, it is a pause that she is forced to have. And uh, for that, I think uh, um, fertility preservation is very helpful. Okay, thank you very much for, for that. Uh, sticking with uh, uh, adenomyosis a little longer, um, what is your um, experience with the outcomes of women with adenomyosis uh, when they get pregnant? Would you advise them to have surgery first? Uh, those are those you would want to get pregnant. Uh, Dr. Mark as well can give us uh, his experience on this. Adenomyosis and pregnancy. Well, Dr. Mark, go ahead. Okay, well, I can go ahead. Uh, well, adenomyosis, um, as the professor uh, outlined very clearly, is uh, one of those diseases that gives us a number of uh, challenges uh, when people are trying to conceive uh, because of the bulkiness of the uterus and the altered hormonal as well as um, uh, peritoneal function, cell-mediated factors that come in, which give us a, a little bit of a problem. When you've decided, uh, there are two scenarios. If you have decided not to do surgery and someone wants to conceive, uh, down regulation for about two to three months would give them a better chance of conception um, uh, before, uh, before they, they do conceive, because that will help definitely with the reduction in the, in the disease process. But also, if you've decided to do surgery, uh, as, doc, as a Professor said, you've done an OSADA procedure You've given them about three months of, um, of uh, healing, and then they conceive. If they conceive naturally, uh, that would be very good. But if you have decided to do, uh, for example, uh, IVF, you would definitely have to do the down regulation. And then, uh, of course, the surgery has been done, and then probably you might add on a little bit of down regulation, two to three months, and then you can do your uh, frozen embryo transfer which would uh, improve markedly their chances of a uh, live birth rate uh, after, after that. Uh, Dr. Mark, are there uh, um, cases where you'd consider surrogates um, with adenomyosis and to what extent would you, uh, which sort of women would you advise to have a surrogate uh, if, if surgery can't be done? Or, I mean, Prof can as well add on this. Well, uh, maybe I can start still. Uh, Professor, um, uh, well, uh, the thing is that it will depend on a number of uh, factors. Um, the, the patient might not be one fit for surgery for various reasons. They've had numerous surgeries. Uh, somewhere in the chat box I saw someone had uh, asked about someone who has had over 10 surgeries for endometriosis. 
And of course, you might have a very, very difficult pelvis. And so surgery might not be an option at that particular point. Uh, the other one is that uh, it might be a, a preference uh, because of the surgeries that they have had, they might not want to go ahead with a surrogate. But of course, the other th rather to go ahead with a pregnancy on their own. But of course, the other issue might be that the adenomyosis is almost occupying a very big percentage, over 70, 80% of uh, the uterus. And you think that they might not benefit uh, very easily from um, the, 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 the surgery. They have probably even other antecedent factors like uterine fibroids, uh, in submucosal fibroids, many of them. And you think that you're probably going to get a very difficult um, or a, a very hostile endometrium after your surgery, then a surrogate will definitely be in order because um, maybe you've done um, a hysteroscopy after the surgery, you find someone has severe uh, Asherman syndrome, and then uh, of course uh, a surrogate would uh, definitely be a, a consideration for this patient. Thank you very much. Prof, any addition on this, please? Yeah, well, um, probably um, I'm fascinated by the difficult surgeries, not, not by the easy ones. So particularly if there's 80% of the uterus is being um, converted into adenomyosis, uh, Dr. Mark, I, I feel attracted by helping those uh, patients, particularly if they also do have fibroids, because now, we, we still will find enough tissue in order to reconstruct the uterus. It takes longer. This is not sort of everyday surgery, but if you really take your time, you can manage this. And uh, I have quite a number of patients that after such type of surgery got pregnant. And uh, this, is, this is my... Um, my reward for having spent uh, hours in, in doing all the, not only removing, but also reconstructing. So, so from that point of view, I, I can only encourage everybody to sort of learn this and refine this to be uh, more, more advanced in the outcome of this type of surgery. And just to answer one question that was popping up, and that is talking about uh, cervical cerclage. Um, to my mind, I do not see any reason for doing a cervical cerclage in, in case of endometriosis. This I have done um, extensively in cases where women had recurrent abortion because of incompetent cervix. And then one should perform a cervical cerclage in combination with a closure of uh, the cervical canal. All right, uh, thank you very much. I think that question answers Dr. Debayo from Nigeria. You answered about, uh, uh, you put that question across about cervical cerclage. Um, Dr. Katunji asks, um, I think this will go to Dr. Yamal and, and you can also give your uh, comments and questions. Um, to prof as you had uh, elucidated yeah someone asks what are the obstetric complications um things like uh, abnormal placentation uh, after uh, adenomyosis surgery what is your comment dr emma uh thank you dr spire i think uh dr. After emma. yes can you hear me yeah all right yeah i say i think uh, yes I'm yes an extensive adenomyosis surgery, uh, that is quite a possibility, especially if the if the the you know endometrial myometrial junction has been interfered with a lot. Now, uh, if you do the the adenomyosis surgery properly, uh, the way he said in the modified Osada technique, or the flap technique, the triple flap technique that can be done laparoscopically. Uh, what you're leaving is a, a centimeter of uh, myometrial towards the serosal layer and a roughly a centimeter that is outside the endometrial lining, the junction. And you excise all the rest of the tissue and then you overlap them and flap them over, which means you try not to open up the endometrial cavity if you can. Uh, then in that case, the chances of that would be lower because you're giving a stronger uh, repair of two layers on top of each other. Whereas if you just repair it, 
adjacent to each other, then definitely that's a very weak uterus and the risk of rupture even prematurely antenatally remains. So it has to be it has to be a meticulous repair. So adenomyosis surgery, extensive diffuse adenomyosis surgery, is not in the removal of the adenomyosis, as very rightly said by Prof. The the, the challenging part is the reconstruction. So if the reconstruction is done well, then I think we can reduce those uh, risks as well. Uh, thank you. A any comments, Prof? Otherwise, I had a few uh, questions I just wanted to bring up and have uh, you clarify for the rest of the audience. Yeah. No, 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 I fully agree with you. Um, the point is, particularly in infertility, we have to also compromise our surgery, but still we have to try to be as radical as possible. Thank you. So, uh, Prof, a, a few uh, clarifications, I think, uh, that's just come up. Uh, number one, when you, when Vizan, many patients do ask us, when Vizan is used, let's say, for example, would you limit the duration of Vizan, and if so, to how long? Well, first of all, Vizan was first introduced as um, DinoGest, I think, in Japan. And Japan has experience with uh, this drug for several years. So I have patients that are fine with it. They have no side effects. They, they take it sort of for, for many years. Yes. All right, good. Uh, number two, would you agree with me on one statement for deep or extensive endometriosis? Uh, if surgery is needed, always laparoscopy, preferably never laparotomy. Well, yes, of course, but this is my, my political statement. You know, I, yes, yes, I, yes. I have been brought up as a, uh, as a laparoscopic surgeon, even though I do extensive oncosurgery, but um, the, the fine art is um, uh, doing laparoscopic surgery. And as we know, um, in, in most cases, we can do things sometimes even better because particularly when we are at the uh, um, rectal vaginal septum, uh, we have a much better vision uh, laparoscopically than if we do it by, by uh, open lap uh, laparotomy. Cool. Cool. Thank you. Uh, another question that normally baffles many of us when we see our patients in the clinic, and many of them come and tell us, uh, Doc, uh, I really don't understand why I got it. And uh, I tell them that, uh, you know, obviously the causative agent is not very clear. The, there are so many theories. It's a disease of theories and there are possible risk factors. And so, you know, I, would you agree that uh, what are the main points we would like our doctors attending, attending this at least to focus on when giving some sort of counseling to our patients as to why this has happened. Uh, there is question on hereditary, there is question on tissue injury and repair, and there is the one of the microbiome of the reproductive and the GI system. I think, what would you focus on when you're counseling your patients when they ask you that question, which is a tough one? Well, the, the, the answer to the question of why which I know from, from my children, also from my grandchildren, usually is the most difficult to answer. But, <clears throat> but the, the three different theories that you mentioned can be answered by pointing out one thing. And uh, I think we also discussed um, during Tumu Tumu, um, as humans, we have a very specific placenta, the hemochorial placenta. And um, after delivery, it leaves a quite an extensive wound surface in the uterus and only the contraction of the uterus reduces the bleeding and if the the contraction is very strong the the blood loss is minimal of course there's blood loss of three four hundred or five hundred mils but not more if there is a woman that cannot contract her uterus properly then she will have a massive blood loss. And meanwhile, she will have died out. So she is not the survivor over ages, let's say one million years or, or so. <clears throat> now, evolution has favored those human women with a very thorough contraction of the uterus. So the survivors are the ones 
that that can see the uterus contract massively and some do it more and others less so this is basically it is a benefit and i can see you smiling so you know <clears throat> and i and and i like to also to to show that there is not always only a, a negative aspect to it there is also a beneficial aspect to it but <clears throat> in these women suffering from endometriosis the hyperperistalsis the hypercontractility of the uterus is causing them this this disease and and uh, making pain but this is something which of course it is hered hereditary and of course there might be some genes linked to it but this concept which has also been uh, put forward by Lion Decker, who also, also got this tissue injury and repair um, concept. <clears throat> but it is it is very, very easy to understand and I think also easy uh, to, to um, uh, distribute to, um, to patients and to other doctors. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much. Uh, number one, another thing, uh, a little bit of maybe a brief on dietary and lifestyle changes that seems to help with the patients. Any, yes. any comment on that? Yes. Yes. Well, there is, um, I won't say an industry, but um, there is a big branch um, that focuses on this. There should be cookbooks uh, for endometriosis. There is endometriosis diet. And the, you know, as, as much as I, I'm not a cook, unless perhaps you, I think you, you do cook uh, quite well. I'm not a good cook. Not, this is left to my wife, but um, red meat should be uh, um, omitted. Um, uh, milk products should be omitted. Uh, unfortunately, also red wine, uh, like all other products that have histamines. And uh, one new aspect is one has to take care of the microbioma of the gut because there are some bacteria in the gut microbioma that can cause inflammation. And uh, we have a lab nearby that, uh, that have um, sort of specialized in uh, the microbioma of endometriosis. And they can tell you, you have to do something or your microbioma is fine. Yes. Thank you. And in lifestyle, does exercise and yoga or meditation help? Yes, always. Um, <clears throat> um, first of all, you reduce stress. Yeah. And uh, secondly, we, we know that physical exercise does, um, does help um, also to re reduce the pain perception. So it might not help uh, get rid of the disease, but the way the disease... Um, is um, is appearing to this patient. However, I, I have some patients that come and tell me I was very active in sports, but now I cannot do like running because whenever, whenever I, I hit uh, the ground, then I feel pain. And others have problem by, by lifting their leg. So uh, the endometriosis, depending on what side it is, uh, can can make them uh, not being able to do exercise. But in general, exercise is excellent. Now coming to yoga, with my, let me say, Indian background, I, I realized that yoga is, um, is fantastic and is uh, all these different forms of yoga that, that are very, very helpful. And in combination with Ayurvedic medicine, I, I can only advise to, to go this way. And you probably have seen that uh, I advocate um, a complementary medicine. And this also includes uh, traditional Chinese medicine. And it also includes traditional Indian medicine. And part of this is yoga. And part of this is Ayurvedic medicine. And I have uh, uh, um, sent some patients to Ayurvedic clinics in Germany and they are very well. Unfortunately, they say we cannot afford to go there regularly because it is all um, on private payment base. Thank you. And uh, one or two last comments or questions. Uh, many patients do report dissatisfaction over their care over the years, and many 
do repeat, no need repeat treatment or surgery. How do we reduce this? So I brought this up because uh, I, I, I now happen to have very many patients, probably after four or five or six or two previous surgeries, uh, come in for uh, uh, an, an opinion and then treatment. So there is this option of diagnostic laparoscopy in, in places where the full workup was not done. And I would, I would want to sensitize uh, many of our colleagues who do this. And once they go in and are surprised by a frozen pelvis, I think it is sometimes safer to identify, document, record, take pictures, but then stop if they feel they are not able to complete the surgery. I think that is not doing harm rather than completing and doing something in, inappropriate or incomplete, leading to the patient probably getting more adhesions, lack of planes, and then more difficult surgeries in future. So, so what would your statement be in such situ situ scenarios? And, and how do we reduce this risk of uh, repeated surgeries in patients. Well, thank you, Yamal. This this is um, a question that um, that raises a sad point, um, and I think this has a lot to do with the self image of doctors. And we know we, we have all sorts of doctors with um, advantages and disadvantages, and unfortunately, uh, endometriosis is a, a special entity. Um, and it requires experience and also good guidance, as what uh, Dr. Nyagi was mentioning. And uh, a lot of doctors, they, they feel they should touch everything and they, they should also operate on everything. And uh, I have made the same observation as you, that um, it has not been done the proper way, which then induces the next surgery and the next surgery and the next surgery. And we had one comment of a woman with 10 surgeries and still is not uh, satisfactory. So once you, once, well, this is, this is a very difficult topic and I do not know, we have the same problem over here and uh, it, you cannot eradicate this because um, it, it is important for doctors to, to stick to what they can do best and not to do everything. And uh, I can understand that particularly in your setting, um, people are afraid to send someone to a specialist because they are afraid that people will stick to the specialist. But they do not see that this, the specialist is overrun with patient. And so they, they just will perform the surgery and they will be happy to return the patient to the one doctor that had referred them. So that is a knowledge that has to be um, persuasive enough to um, to educate those those doctors. But when you you as the specialist get a patient that had so many surgeries, please do not go for another uh, diagnostic laparoscopy. But do the imaging be before and do a very good vaginal ultrasound and perhaps also do an MRI by a specialist that is interested in, in, in endometriosis. Because, and this is how I'm explaining to my patients, um, when I go from Frankfurt to Munich, I switch on my nav navigation system, my GPS system, and, and I will rely on a proper guidance. And this to me as a surgeon is my guidance because in laparoscopy, I see the surface. And I might not see the, the, the sidetrack where I have to go in order to remove um, the endometriosis implant. And this is, this is why, why we have to, to do this in order to avoid unnecessary extra surgery. Yeah, thank you very much. For, uh, Dr. Yamal, you. are you done with your comments? <clears throat> yes, I'm done. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for those wonderful comments. Uh, they answer a lot of questions I had. Uh, maybe last, the Prof, I wanted you to comment about the theory of uh, microbioma. I, uh, it is uh, an exciting theory that is coming up, uh, especially explaining the spread of uh, endometriosis to several areas. I also come to learn that uh, in women, the peritoneal cavity is not necessarily sterile, 
because of uh, uh, the, uh, the migration from the vagina, including um, uh, microbes hanging on the tail of sperms. Um, someone asked, and, and this is also a comment, I don't know what you said about this. Uh, what is the role of recurrent vaginal infection to the pathogenesis of endometriosis? Is, is there anything uh, like that? Have you explored that, uh, that area as well? Or is it true that recurrent vaginal infections can cause endometriosis? Well, <clears throat> first of all, it is not that recurrent vaginal infection will cause endometriosis. It can be the other way around because we know that endometriosis has an impact on the immune system. So if someone has a severe endometriosis, it might have an impact on, um, on the vagina, particularly if this woman is under treatment. If this woman is under treatment of, um, of gestogens, uh, or of progestins and or of GNIH analogs, we thereby reduce the estradiol level. And these women then have a hypoestrogenism of the vagina, and therefore uh, the, the vaginal flora is at risk. Yeah, but it's not the other way around. It's not that um, recurrent infections will cause endometriosis. Okay, thank you very much. Um, in your presentation, I, I... I understood that uh, the issue of having endo warriors is very important in the treatment of endometriosis. We have a number of endo warriors on this platform and they are represented by Grace. Uh, Grace is a nurse. She has been a fighter of, um, and she decided to form an association, a foundation of endometriosis um, warriors in Uganda. Grace, uh, can you please unmute yourself and I, I saw you have a, a question here in the box. Can you unmute yourself and ask the question and also give us a bit of your experience uh, as a, an endo warrior? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm so glad to be in this meeting and to really have met all of you, our dear gynecologists, our dear doctors. Thanks, Dr. Chibundu. So my name is Grace Nagawa, an endo warrior and a nurse, and the founder of Endometriosis Foundation Uganda. Um, yes. Am I clear? Yes, absolutely. Sorry? Absolutely clear. Yes, go yes, go right yeah. ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So I've had endo for over now 19 years and I was diagnosed at 27 years of age because I think I began at 14 years of age. That's when I had this menstrual pain. It was so painful <clears throat> and I had it for two weeks. I used to have my menses for two weeks. So from 14 years of age, I used to have this pain, but I used to go to hospitals, but I never diagnosed that I had endo. I used to be in horrible pain, moving hospitals, treated for UTI and PIDs. So that problem kept on increasing. I used not to have clear blood. It used to be um, dark spots, crampy, horrible pain. So at 27 years of age, by then, uh, like, Eight years back, I used to get daily pain. That pain that I only used to get during my menses, it kept on being pain before, pain during, pain after, until it became daily pain. So by the time it was daily pain, I used to get pregnancy symptoms, nauseated, headache, chronic headache. Like you get that headache for a month, for months, and it doesn't clear away with painkillers. I had to get bleeding ulcers because of the horrible painkillers we take, Ibumex. I used to faint on injectables. So um, wherever I would take like pethidine, I would black out. So it was really a long journey and surprisingly doctors couldn't tell I had endo. So at 27 years, that was 2007, 2020, 2017, that's when I was diagnosed and it was already stage four. So at that time of diagnosis, still as told, I couldn't be managed here in Uganda. 
um, it was it had affected all my ovaries. It was ovarian angel, and the intestines had the cells. The abdominal wall had the cells. So I told I couldn't be managed here. Yeah, I had to move to the referral hospital, and I saw the same thing. You die with that life, with that pain. We have no cure for this severe stage. So we tried to move abroad and as worked on in Nairobi by Professor Rafik. So it was done well because my life changed. I felt much better. I had that energy in me. I felt the pain had reduced. And I thank God. And that's how we came up to found Endometriosis Foundation Uganda. I'm so grateful that now we have Dr. Chibundu. He's really working hard to see that at least we can now manage it in Uganda. It has been so hard. You find that many of the endo warriors here, uh, people join in and someone will tell you, I have had three surgeries, I've had two surgeries, but at times the condition is just worsened. So you find that getting a better surgery at least changes our life. Uh, so we found Endometriosis Foundation Uganda and basically what we do is sensitization to the health workers because many doctors seriously uh, take a period of pain to be normal. So they try to normalize this pain and as the condition is growing from stage one to, to the severe stage. So you find that we do sensitization, we do counseling and health education. Uh, we also support ladies with endometriosis assess at least best health care management. You find that if we get this, once we get these ladies, they are supported psychologically, we do counseling uh, and link them to the best health facilities. You know, we thank Dr. Chibuno and that guy on the group that have been so supportive and helping endo warriors. You find that treatment for endo is really so expensive. Someone has to get all of this, get cases are really high. Okay, you find that many of us have, which is so expensive. I've seen. Hello. Yeah, so um, I've seen Dr. Mingo on the group, a fertility specialist. How we wish we can really partner and see how we can work together. Because at times we really get, you know, we have warriors on the group. Someone is journeying with an endo. And then you find that even fertility we have that storage of the eggs, even okay. is so physical. We thank you so much for come up to really dive professional surgeries. Personally, yeah, yeah, because I really went through a lot as a nurse. I kept on upgrading, but you find that even doctors, even many gynecologists, instead of someone referring, some, referring some, something he can't do, they go ahead, do something, and then the condition is worsened. Because by the time I had my surgery in Nairobi, the guy was like, the person who did the first surgery just made things worse. So you find that through the sensitization in hospitals, you know, we shall have, uh, you know, doctors get more skills, get to know that this condition exists and we are really supported. We are so many, you find that we are many ones because we try to, you know, advocate um, on TV, we try to have sessions. Many people call in from dif different centers of the country. Many people would love to know, people have gone, have been going through this, and knowing people don't understand. So you find that we are really many. And once we have doctors like you, I think our lives will be changed. Our lives will be changed. Yeah. Thank you so much. I've yeah. tried to be a kind of brief because uh, my battery is getting low, but we are so grateful. Personally, I'm being encouraged by the endo warriors. You know, coming up and talking about this has really changed my life. After the surgery, I was told to try to conceive in one year, though I've still failed. It's now four years. 
I'm trying to, you know, her soul to go back, her still fail to conceal because my ovaries were really bad. But we are grateful. Personally, four years now, I've never gone to any hospital. I'm managing my life with diet and lifestyle. You find that after being educated on what we are supposed to eat, we really tell the endo warriors most of these things because those who can't afford the surgery start on the diet and lifestyle as they try to work hard and see that can go for the surgery. So from my surgery, I can't say I got healed because I still get the symptoms. I still get the cysts, the chocolate cysts, but was I work on my diet, for sure the cysts shrink. So doctor, I would also love you to talk more about this because it's like I'm managing myself with a diet and lifestyle. I get cysts, they shrink with a diet basically. Yeah, thank you so much. And Okay, great. Thank you very much for. We pray for that, that we we'll still get such learning, so Doctor Shibunde. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing us uh, with us your story. I know there are many women out there who are suffering with endo, and um, the issue of advocacy is very important, as you said. Yeah. Uh, please um, let's work together and see how we can help. Um, I want to have the final part. Uh, Dr. Njagi, can you please give us your final shots as we, we wind up? Yeah, I, I think mine is to... I'm sorry, there's a bit of a background. Yes, um, I think I have to mute this. Okay, go right ahead. Okay, so I think mine is to thank uh, you, Dr. Spire, for organizing this webinar and uh, special thanks to Professor Hans Tinnerberg for creating time and uh, enlightening us on more about endometriosis. Again, as I started by saying, I'm really overwhelmed that we are now having conversation about endometriosis. Uh, uh, so to Grace uh, and uh, representing a majority of patients who are suffering from endometriosis, uh, there's hope. And um, I think uh, you're starting a process that uh, uh, some of these challenges will be handled locally. So we say local solution for local problems. Uh, where you don't have to fly to Nairobi. Um, and uh, I think mine is that I want to finish by saying uh, that um, first surgery should always be the best surgery. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, for me, it's have a good night. Thank you, Dr. Njagi. Uh, Dr. Miingo, any final parts? Dr. Mark? Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Spire. Uh, Professor, thank you very much. I want to thank my panelists, my colleagues uh, on the uh, forum. Uh, I think it's very, very important that uh, uh, the endometriosis surgeons uh, work very closely with the fertility specialists uh, because, uh, of course, we, it's, as Professor said, this is a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, we have um, things that probably might need to be discussed with the people doing the surgeries, and as well as uh, issues about conception, issues about fertility preservation, that we need to have a discussion about before uh, surgery is uh, definitely undertaken. Uh, and as uh, Professor rightly said, I think it's important we all upgrade our skills so that we can be able to uh, give uh, these ladies the best type of uh, treatment and care and uh, decide when to do surgery and when not to do surgery. I think it's very, very important, especially uh, in the, military, uh, the endometriosis warrior. Uh, we, we pledge that we will definitely work very, very closely with the endometriosis society to be able to see how best we can give you a service uh, to make sure that your fertility, your fertility desires are met. Thank you very much and good evening to everyone. Thank you, Dr. Mingo. Dr. Yamal, your final shot, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chikundu, very much for this excellent uh, presentation, I mean, excellent webinar today. Uh, I'm really grateful to again hear such wise words from 
Professor Tinnerberg and uh, our panelists. My final words would be a few specific comments. Number one, let us all understand that for endometriosis management, we will first and foremost need to listen to our patients, listen and make joint decisions. Uh, let's not try and put our, our decisions onto them, but let's listen to them and make joint decisions, number one. Number two, uh, let's understand if possible, let's try and get a, a, a certain army of surgeons prepared who can do history, palpation, ultrasound imaging themselves and surgery by one person to get the best results. So it means the surgeon should be trained in all those areas including the transversal competencies in the pelvis. So near the ureter, near the bladder, near the rectum is all part of that one surgeon. Fine, second, another statement is, let's understand endometriosis, especially advanced surgery is minimal invasive surgery. Please let's shy away from opening these patients up. We do not help them over time, we make it worse. So another important point, endometriosis management is multidisciplinary. We need to have a team, a team that in, engulfs a big group of people who, in, who are involved in management of this patient. And that this patient of endometriosis patients, especially when it's uh, advanced disease, should be a chronic continuous care model. It should not be a one-time surgery and done. It should be a chronic continuous care model that takes them through the different phases of life, fertility, pain, quality of life, uh, emotional support, uh, rehab, et cetera, et cetera. And when we finally bend down to do surgery, remember one thing as surgeons, for this disease, you'll have to be radical to the disease but conservative to the function. Thank you very much. And I have a good evening from my side. Thank you very much, Dr. Yamal. I want to thank my panelists for this wonderful discussion you shared with us so well. We've learned quite a lot. I want to thank Prof. Prof, can you please give us your closing remarks? <laughs> well, um, thank you very much for this webinar. It again <laughs> showed me that there is great interest in this very specific uh, disease in gynecology. I think Dr. Yamal had said all the important uh, aspects. I might add one aspect to it, and that is, I see that there is already um, the formation of this army of specialists, like also you, including you, Dr. Spire, because first is the interest and the patience to, um, to sit down and learn about this and get experience in it. But also the others that uh, spoke on the subject. And um, this is a very good perspective for the future. And last but not least, even though I don't like the name of Endo Warrior, I'm very sure by patient support groups, um, supporting the awareness to this, they will also push doctors as what I also saw in the comments, to listen more and to make the right combination that this could be a disease, this could be endometriosis and not if you have pain and I can see something, then you don't have anything. So uh, in this again, thank you very much for having this webinar and having compiled all these interesting people together. And uh, I hope that also in the future, I could be instrumental to your progress. Yep, thank you very much, Prof. Um, we are ever so grateful to have you today um, for sparing your wonderful time to be with us and share with us uh, this experience. Um, on behalf of the Association of Laparoscopic Surgeons of Uganda, I want to thank everyone who has joined in from all over the world. I see people from Nigeria, from Kenya, Tanzania, and everywhere. Uh, we can do this over and over again. And um, I want to say thank you to everyone and good night. Bye. Good night. <laughs>